All right, so welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is Lecture 6, Sequel Continued, and this is Happy Cat, as many of you may know him. I thought a nice uh, segue from last week to this would be one, to point out who exactly Happy Cat is. He's sort of the leader of the lol cats, if you're unfamiliar with this world. And he now exists in plush doll form. <laughs> Um, I was sadly one of the first people to uh, hop on this wagon when a friend informed me that lolmart.com, um, uh, I, which I think is run by the same folks as iconhascheeseburger.com, now sell Happy Cat in plush form, as well as Lolrus, the walrus, if you're familiar with him as well. So you can check that out online if, uh, if maybe you have children who would like this kind of thing, much like I do. Uh, so today is about continuing our chat. Uh, with SQL, but I thought we'd open up beyond, uh, besides this point on a note of silliness with another stupid bug of the week. This one submitted to us by one of your classmates. It took me a moment to figure out what the bug was since this was emailed to me this morning without explanation, but I did eventually catch on. So this is Bank of America's website. He apparently was checking his accounts. Oh, you're much quicker than I was. It took me like a minute to figure out what the student was uh, trying to get at. Anyone not see it yet? Want to be in my camp? OK, three, three of us, four. All right, focus on the top left, uh, the day of the week when the person checked their accounts. Yeah, so presumably this has to do with daylight savings time, some kind of time-related bug, but you'd kind of like to think that a bank who deals with financial transactions might have gotten something like this right. Hopefully it's just an aesthetic detail, uh, but it is today's uh, stupid bug of the week. So it's funny, though. I, it's, this is one of those situations probably where if you reported this bug to someone on the website, it probably would never reach the right person, uh, especially since the, tech, the customer service people certainly can't recreate this particular bug. So uh, it'll be interesting to see a year hence if we can repeat this same demonstration. So we shall see. So today is about continuing our chat about SQL. Um, but recall that with project one and in previous lectures, we didn't really need a database engine. So we've talked about XML files. We've talked briefly about CSV files. And we'll talk about those again a bit more tonight in the context of Yahoo Finance. But we finally introduced MySQL last week, a database engine proper. But why? Who cares? What was the point? What is the point? Store data long term. I can do that pretty long with XML files, with CSV files, with ASCII files. Yeah? Larger, faster, multi user, bigger Oh, so the, that's actually a pretty good answer. So it's better for uh, an actual database engine, that is a piece of software whose purpose in life is to store data and perform queries on data, to update, to delete data. I mean, that's really when you begin to enter, uh, that, that's the role that an actual database engine plays. Um, when you need multiple users accessing it, when you want to offer different levels of control, read-only access, read-write access, you want fine-grained control over what tables can be accessed by whom. If you also want better performance, as you've probably experienced in your own Project ones, especially if your files were large, your XPath queries were sort of foolish, I mean, processing data again and again without any kinds of optimization can begin to bog down an application. Think, after all, with an XML file. Every damn hit to your website probably induced a parsing of that file, even if you just wanted one snippet of information, like the price of some item in the menu. So there's clearly an opportunity there conceptually for optimizing that problem, but it's kind of hard to optimize what's ultimately just a text file. So it's when you have a database engine that you can begin to be more clever. And you can introduce concepts from you know, data structures classes, algorithms classes that you might have once taken to actually solve these problems more effectively. Yeah? Also, the XML really represents a tree. Absolutely. So XML data represents a tree, some hierarchical data, which is very often quite nice. But sometimes you don't need necessarily that structure. Um, in fact, I would actually I would push back on that comment only though for one reason, because I would say quite often folks find that relational databases, which as we dis began to discuss last week, which are tabular in form, columns and rows, are arguably uh, less convenient sometimes for certain data sets. Because you can certainly imagine taking what's a hierarchical, uh, what's a linear data structure, sort of row oriented, and just turn it into XML, whereby each of your elements is effectively just one row. But it's a little harder to go back in the other direction. And the 
So non-repetition of notes. So there's certainly in an inefficiency in storing XML because you're redundantly storing the metadata again and again. So yeah, absolutely, you move away from that if you actually turn more to a, so example, a database engine. True, true. If you want to actually have interrelationships among your data in XML, more of the burden is on you, the maintainer of the data. And you can do it by way of IDs and references to IDs. But yes, I would agree that it's a little more burdensome at that point if you have to be generating this content. Is this a, a pan beginning to go off? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I think there comes a point, and that point in our context will be project two, where I think you'll feel that it just no longer makes sense to try to constrain yourself to something like a simple text file or an XML file. In fact, one of the topics that'll come up come up tonight is this notion of transactions and race conditions more generally, whereby if you have multiple users trying to access the same data, and worse, trying to write to the same data, it's sort of non-obvious how you can prevent your data from getting corrupted or for your users from seeing old, stale data unless you have something more intelligent than just the file-based mechanisms that we've looked at thus far. Last week, we talked briefly about F-lock, which is sort of an age-old file locking mechanism that works on many systems, but not necessarily all. And that was sort of our poor man's approach to implementing um, transactions, which we'll see more formally tonight. So this was the slide that somehow went missing from last week. I thought I'd bring this up just for the sake of discussion, because one of the interesting parts, I think, about actually moving to a proper database engine, whether it's MySQL or Oracle or Microsoft Access, is that you have discretion not only over how your data is laid out in actual tables, as we'll see today, but also what data types you use. So even though we've sort of moved away from the notion of data types, or at least strong typing in PHP, JavaScript too, is going to sort of wave it hand, its hand at the notion of data types. In MySQL and in SQL in general, you do typically have discretion over the data types that you throw at your uh, data that you want to store. So I've sort of somewhat arbitrarily categorized things here. The top left are the textual related data types that are supported by MySQL. Then you have some date and time related ones, some numeric ones, some floating point ones, some binary data, these uh, binary large object blobs. Uh, and then some miscellaneous ones that didn't really fit into any categories. And you'll find that many of these data types are shared across database engines, such that you can move from MySQL to PostgreSQL or to Oracle if you have at least um, not done something that's in any way proprietary. But these days, you'll find that most of these data types are shared across systems. But it is worthwhile and important to certainly familiarize yourself with the actual engine that you're using. So this particular link, um, which is very easily found via Google or whatnot, entitled Data Type Storage Requirements, just speaks to the size of the data that you can put in these various types. And much like you would exercise this kind of discretion when coding in C or C++, especially if you're trying to be sensitive to the uh, space requirements of your data types, this is sort of the canonical source to go if you have to decide some very, fairly common uh, things. So for instance, we noticed even last week we had some discretion over uh, what type of field to use for, I think it was a name or something textual. And we ultimately went with this type called bar char, but we discussed briefly the alternative being char. And you can kind of recall just from the names alone, but what was the distinction between those two data types, char and var char? Sorry? So white space in what sense? So that's true. The two data types do handle white space, uh, leading and trailing slightly differently, but also in terms of the amount of space they take up. What must you do when using the char data type? So declare a finite fixed size, whereby if you insert a value like the name David into a na field called name, and that field is of type char, say char 24 or char 50, you are specifically reserving 24 or 50 bytes for that actual field, even though David is D-A-V-I-D, you're therefore wasting those additional bytes. And so very commonly used is var char, variable char, which as the name implies, only uses as much space as, as is necessary to store the actual field, but even last week, Someone uh, proposed what the downside was of what seems to be a very compelling feature. Uh, 
efficiency. So you'll find, at least with large data sets, that if your tables columns, which you might think of conceptually as this in like an Excel spreadsheet, are really rather ragged because strings are of different lengths in each of them, the computer can't know exactly where to jump to go from string to string because they're variable numbers of bytes apart. And so you have to do sort of the old school approach of checking every character. Is this the null character? And if it is, then you know that you're at the end of the string and at the start of a new one. So you'll find that in very high performance systems, you want to give certainly some thought to these kinds of decisions, because with chars, can the, uh, can the database engine itself generally look up data more quickly, albeit at a computational cost, or a space rather cost. Um, I won't walk us through all of these little details since they're not terribly enlightening exactly how many characters you can store in each of these various types. But come project two, it's among uh, it's these, these kinds of questions that you'll have to ask yourself so that you're sort of balancing nicely the trade-offs between the amount of space you're using or wasting, the performance that you're trying to achieve, and whether you can actually store uh, the data in question. For instance, one of the things you'll do in Project 2, which recall is an E-Trade-like website that's got to empower users to buy and sell, quote unquote, stocks, check their portfolio, log in, register, is that they're going to need to store the amount of cash that they have on hand. And you're going to need to store a history of transactions, how much you paid for a share of Microsoft stock, how much you paid for a share of Google's. So what data type might immediately come to mind for storing that kind of financial data? So float or decimal? OK, so floats, as you probably know from many languages, come with a bit of disclaimers, right? Because you have only imprecision storage with floating points. And it might be viable to store, for instance, pennies. But if you start talking about fractions of pennies, which is indeed going to be the case, especially for the uh, penny stock, uh, whose value has plummeted even since I went to press with the PDF, um, and you'll find that uh, rounding error is not so good in the world of finance. And so fortunately, MySQL offers the decimal data type, where you can actually specify how many digits you want to be able to store to the left of the decimal point and how many you want to be able to store to the right of the decimal point. So in this case, can you actually specify exactly how much precision you want without having to worry about this very low-level implementation detail that you've had to perhaps struggle with over the years just because it's sort of a reality of hardware? implementations of the concept of a real number. So there, too, you want to turn your attention to the nuances among these data types so that you're not doing the, uh, the office space or the Superman 3 style uh, shaving of pennies off of your user's portfolio. So more on this as, as we proceed. Um, let's go ahead and do this. We began looking at uh, some dynamic website design a while back when we looked at uh, that login feature. And that code that we glanced at a while ago and we'll expand on today will actually be one of the nicest ways to start Project 2, since one of the features you will need, I seem not to have made it available, um, one of the features you will need, ultimately, is this ability to log in. So let me go ahead and do this. Uh, let's lecture 6, source. So recall that we had this particular demonstration. You went to this page here, and a few weeks ago we had versions 1 through 4. Now we'll have versions 5 through 8, which are better because they don't hard code a username and password of jharvard and crimson. So just to do a quick refresher, it was a few weeks ago where we had this ability. It was probably in our first example of source code. Let me go to version 1. Recall that version 1 had this very simple form where if I typed in jharvard and the wrong password, I would simply end up here. I didn't uh, have much more feedback than this ugly thing here. But if I did, in fact, type crimson, I would be, in fact, logged in, returned to the home page, and somehow this home page, home.php, is remembering the fact that I'm logged in. So knowing what you know now about um, PHP's capabilities, how was this implemented? Yeah, so this was implemented by way of a session. So a session is what? Let's make this a little more concrete. OK, so it, it's related to a cookie. It's not a cookie per se, if we want to be really precise. OK, so it's server-side storage of arbitrary key value pairs that are associated with a user by way of a cookie. 
So what happens, to be clear, when I visit a website that has sent a cookie, so when I visit this particular website, let's take it from step one. So I am at this home page here. At this point, I may or may not have received any kind of cookies from this website. Odds are session start, that function was called the moment I got to this page. So what does that function do, session start, that you were again, maybe just told uh, on faith to put at the top of every file that the user interacts with? What is that doing? So it's generating what? So it's generating a large random number that may actually have some alphabetical characters in it, just because we're not using decimal, but something like hex or something else altogether, base64. So it's a really large number. What does the server then do with that big random number? OK, so it puts it in a cookie. What does this mean in the context of HTTP? So I'm the web server, Apache or whatnot. I now have generated a really big number. A request from a user has just come in for home.php. What do I do with this number specifically? Yeah, so I add it to the HTTP headers that get sent back. So recall that the header sent is very simply called set hyphen cookie colon, and then essentially that big random number is inserted there. It's then up to the browser to do what with that value in the future? Send it back each time. To send it back every darn time. So in other words, every subsequent request that that browser sends to me should come not with a set cookie header, because the Browsers don't set cookies, servers set cookies, but the browser should respond with every web page request for this particular domain with an additional HTTP header that is cookie, colon, and whatever that big random number was. So in this way, it's sort of like stamping the user's hand or stamping the browser's hand. And every time he asks you for a web page, he extends that hand. And on that hand is that really big random number. So why is this useful? Well, in addition to that pseudo random number having been created, what was also created server side? So storage, what does that mean? OK, so it could be memory, could be a file. In the context of PHP, it's just a text file. In fact, it tends to, by convention, be a text file called SESS uh, underscore and then really big number. So session underscore really big number. So that's sort of its way of ensuring uniqueness. And then where is that file with that really ugly name stored by convention? So on the server, and specifically in slash temp, so the temp directory on the server. And in fact, just to make this more real, if I'm on CS75.net here, which is representative of a typical LAMP, uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP web server, and I do an ls in the temp directory, I mean, there are a whole bunch of sessions for people who have been interacting with this server. Now, a little bit of uh, beware here. The fact that I am now revealing to you 100 or so session IDs means technically you could try hijacking someone's session on the particular website. It's really not hard for us to protect against that, since I can simply go in here. And now this is when we uh, uh, potentially do a disservice to our distance students tuning in at the moment. But if I simply do this command here, what's going to happen? No, yeah, that's OK. Be very careful, though, with your R, your dash Fs. And what's going to happen if I hit delete here? This is a way of my fixing what's a very dangerous lecture demonstration on camera. Yeah, so it's going to wipe it all out. Now, is there important data stored there? Well, if someone is trying to buy something from the CS75.net store, we might lose a few sales because people's uh, shopping carts are about to be eradicated. Does this affect you and your domains if someone's trying to buy a pizza right now on your project one? Well, no, because these, uh, actually, yes, <laughs> they do. Because if your domain is running on CS75.net, these session IDs are used across the whole server. So in general, not such a good thing, for instance, to publish all of the session IDs IDs currently in use, because as we'll discuss later in the semester, one of the threats on a web server, even to this day with popular websites, is session hijacking, which pretty much just amounts to figuring out someone's session ID and sending it yourself in your own HTTP headers as though you are you. And unless the server is doing some additional constraint checking, which it generally does not do, like IP addresses and whatnot, well, you can immediately log yourself into someone's Facebook account or worse, into their bank accounts. Now, the latter is a bit of a white lie, because bank accounts, bank websites typically use SSL, which means even the cookie value is encrypted back and forth. But even still, if you figure out what it is, you know, there, there's a risk there. Is the hand going up? You just answered. Yeah. So. Oh, OK. So I will, let's see, am I going to create any problems by doing this? Nope, problem gone. 
OK, so we just logged everyone out of the course's website effectively, including the bulletin board, but no real data was lost. Worst case, someone uh, tuning in from afar just has to re-log into the course's website in our case. And I hope you weren't selling real pizzas on your sites because you lost the sale. Yeah. Uh, would a session file be deleted on session destroy? Short answer is I forget. If you actually read the documentation on php.net for uh, the session destroy function, I believe it actually specifies exactly what you really should do in order to eradicate this data. Because what I think, if I recall correctly, it doesn't delete the actual file. In fact, it will leave all of the data that you've actually stored in that file there, um, but uh, it will forget who owns that particular session ID. So it does something along those lines. And actually, let me see if I can do one thing here. Let me go ahead and log in myself to the course's website. I'm going to go up here. Let me log in here. And let me see if this is sufficient time. OK, so we have some random sessions in here. Let me go ahead and pick. I'm not even going to pick mine, because there really shouldn't be anything too sensitive in here. Whoops. So just to make this more clear, OK, so there's nothing in there. Temp, honest-l, sesh. So now, OK, so you'll see that a number of these files have nothing in them, which means a session was created, but the owner of that file didn't actually do anything with it. Let me go ahead and look at the contents of this file. ID member. OK, so this isn't dangerous. OK. <laughs> We always fix it in post-production if we need to. So this is really ugly looking at the moment. But what I've just done is I've run a program, a uh, command called cat, concatenate, just spits out the contents of this session file, just to make more concrete what's been going on. Because based on a lot of the chatter on the bulletin board, it seems like folks have pretty much conceptually grasped on the whole what the session is. But I think you sort of take it to a new uh, level of understanding if you actually understand the simplicity that's really going on underneath the hood. So you have this ability in PHP code to store things in the session. And that's as simple as assigning a variable somewhere inside of the dollar sign underscore session super global. So what is actually happening when that is done? Well, something's getting inserted into that super global variable. And what PHP is really doing for you behind the scenes is quote unquote serializing that information. So if it is just a string that you are putting into the array, like the username of the person who's logged in, PHP has a function called serialize, which takes an in-memory uh, a data structure, whether it's a string or an int or even something a little more complicated, and it serializes it. That is, it converts it to a string based representation that contains enough information so that when it reads that string back in later, it can reconstruct exactly what was in memory. So, for instance, and I'll do this partly in pseudocode, if I did something like dollar sign underscore session uh, and then put in quote unquote foo close quote, and then assign that a value of bar. Essentially, what's going to be stored in that file is a mapping between key foo and value bar. And what will generally happen with, say, the value here is that the, uh, the serialized function, whose documentation we can even look at, will say something like this. And I'm butchering the exact syntax um, because it's not terribly important right now. But it would say something like this, s, I think, colon 3 and then B A R. And again, take this with a grain of salt, doing it sort of off the cuff. But what that means is that the following value is a string. It is three characters long. And here are the actual characters. Now, by contrast, if it were a number, there would be enough information to reconstruct the integer or the floating point value. Or if it were a simple enough object structure, an object could also be serialized in such a way that you could reconstruct an item uh, object that you might have tucked into your session. Some of you ran into troubles while trying to serialize a simple XML object. That's a particularly complicated structure. But certainly for simple objects, they can be serialized into strings and then tucked away in this file. So it looks ugly just because the um, PHP has been fairly space efficient. But notice the S and then the 62, for instance, there on the top right, and then that long URL. So this is just this way of encoding various data types in purely string format because it's so easy to store strings in a file and then just reverse that process on the way out. So to be clear, if you want to even play around with this and figure out what's being stored in your actual uh, cookies, just go ahead and look up PHP's serialize function. Come up with any object, come up with any data type, 
pass it to this function as an argument, and it will spit out the string that PHP itself would use to tuck away into that session file. So this is actually really useful if even you yourself, just skipping ahead slightly, want to use a relational database, as we're going to begin using, which are by nature not object oriented. They're column and row oriented. But you nonetheless, just because it's convenient, want to maintain some kind of object structure in your database. Well, unless you get crazy and try serializing a really huge object, you could just take your PHP variable, which is some kind of object, call the serialize function on it, get back a string, and then do what in that string, if you're sort of following the, the story? Stick that. Yeah, stick that in a cell in the database so that later you can reconstruct it perfectly instead of doing the fairly annoying process, as we'll see, of extracting every damn field from that object, putting it in its own column in the row, and then reversing that whole process. So there, there are trade-offs, to be sure. You're being a little space inefficient storing these strings instead of raw values, but it's an option, and it's a wonderfully useful thing sometimes for small, for small problems. OK, yeah. Uh, not quite. There is a session file which contains the contents of the session superglobal on the server. On the user's computer is just a small text file that contains a really big number. Is it always just that number? Uh, it can contain other information because as you'll see in some of our uh, login examples today, you can write other cookies to a com user's computer. Um, in addition to this automatically stored, uh, this one that's automatically stored there. But for the most part, all that's stored in the browser, so far as the session's concerned, is this really big number. And sometimes it's not even stored in a file, it's just stored in uh, RAM if it's what's called a session cookie, which just means it's supposed to be destroyed when the browser is closed. Which all session cookie, any cookie that's generated as a result of your calling session start is technically given a lifetime of zero, which means this should be thrown away the moment the browser is destroyed. But you'll see an example in just a bit that you can say the lifetime of a cookie should really be seven days, a week, a year, so that it, scratch one of those, um, so that it's actually um, kept around longer by the browser even after they close the window. <laughs> so it's a good question. If you write a, an infinite loop, say intentionally, but just calling while one semicolon in your PHP code, or, <laughs> okay, or accidentally. So it kind of depends. If that PHP file, if we're talking about PHP, is requested by a browser, at some point the browser itself will probably time out based on some browser specific setting, 30 seconds, a minute, maybe even less. At some point the server too would probably kill off that thread if it's just churning and churning away because Apache, for instance, probably makes a reasonable assumption that if, you're, if some thread is busy serving one user for more than n seconds or n minutes, that doesn't really make sense for HTTP traffic. Let me just kill it. But it's also possible that the web server will never kill the connection. And so if you run a process list on your server, you'll just see that one, uh, one script is occupying some large percent of your CPU. So it kind of depends on how uh, attentive the web server is. But restarting tends to fix those problems. Sure. Yeah. Oh, those are annoying and very easy to induce. My, I've done this many, many times. Um, you'll find yourself, maybe you did already, when you use the header function in PHP, spit out location colon followed by a URL, it's very easy to screw that up. It's even easier to screw up .ht access files using mod rewrite such that this page redirects here, but unfortunately this page redirects here, and this one redirects here, and this one redirects here. Your web server is not going to really like that, and I'm not familiar with a web server that automatically detects this, at least out of the box, but browsers, particularly Firefox these days, will assume that, my god, if you're redirecting 30 times back and forth, I'm just going to put an end to this um, myself. So a lot of that's been done client side. So it's even easier. If you're a fan of infinite loops, that's an easy one to, to induce. Yeah? Uh, it's a good question. So. No, this is entirely layer 5 stuff. So um, these session files in the context of PHP are stored locally on disk. Uh, PHP itself, 
I mean, it's, possi I, it's possible the PHP module for Apache remains somewhat resident in memory, in which case some of this stuff might actually not be, uh, might be stored in RAM as well as on disk, but I suspect not. So PHP doesn't really have the notion of shared memory space, which Java, for instance, or Java servlets do, whereby you could just keep this stuff in memory the whole time. I believe PHP out of the box just keeps everything on disk and does not assume it has access to RAM. Typically, not so much PHP itself, but there'd be some cleanup script or some cron job that just removes these things after some amount of time if they've expired or if they've just not been accessed for, many, for much time at all. Yeah? Is there any control over having a badly written client just uh, extend the session file to uh, inconsiderate size? To extend the session? So they, uh, the control? lifetime of a cookie? If they extend the lifetime of a cookie? Probably not. So the cookies expire in such a way that the browser is supposed to respect the fact that when this cookie, let's see, does it expire? Uh, session, this cookie expires. Uh, to be honest, I don't think so. Um, I mean, PHP's implementation is fairly simple. It doesn't have, for instance, a master database that it keeps track of these things in. The expiration time is not embedded into the actual file name. So I'll, I'll check. I'll look around out of curiosity. But I don't think that PHP protects against that. So that if you keep a cookie around forever, even though you were told not to, if the session file still exists, <laughs> PHP will probably honor the request. So I need to um, do some digging to recall exactly how and when PHP clears out, say, these session files to. I, I think I was trying to ask, is there a size limit on the cookie on server? Oh. It, there might, OK, another, this is what always happens. i got to stop taking questions. So um, maybe if there is, it's in the config file called php.ini. I don't think there is. And it, you're pretty safe against, you're somewhat safe against the user, because it's really your code that's responsible for inserting data into the session object. But you could imagine a malicious user adding every type of pizza to their shopping cart just to try to overwhelm your disk space usage. Um, it's possible there's a limit, but I am not sure. If there is, it'd be in that config file. Other questions? They're all very interesting, but sometimes even I need Google in front of me. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So call, you must call session start to inform the server that you want it to be checking for the cookie header or sending the cookie header if it doesn't receive such. Um, but you should indeed call it at the top of any page that needs to utilize the session super global. Yes. Yes. So if you restart Apache, your session should be OK since those files should remain resident on disk. So this brings us to the last question that was an uh, unfortunately but uh, expectedly popular question on the bulletin board, which is, what's the deal with this error message? Uh, uh, headers already sent. There's a problem, right? So I forget the specific error message offhand. But if you ever saw that message, and certainly if you look through the bulletin board, you'll see that many of you encountered this um, uh, headers are uh, delimiter already sent. And this has to do with sessions. And almost always, the staff's response was, make sure you're spitting out nothing before you actually call session start. So what did this actually mean? Well, quite simply, if you had, actually, well, you can just do it with a file. If, we, if you had a file like this, which began with the two PHP braces at the top and bottom, and then at the top you called session, uh, session underscore start, and then you did some stuff like print uh, HTML, and then dot, dot, dot. So this page, while simple, would be fine because there's no actual confusion. What's happening? Well, the moment the file is processed, first some, he some generic headers are actually sent, like the last modification time, the types of files that the servers will link to accept, all the sort of HTTP headers that when we've used that plugin, we just wave our hands at because they're not terribly interesting. But as soon as you call session start, what header is being sent from server to browser? <coughs> 
that set cookie header. Because when you say I want to use sessions, that means I need to either give the user a new random number by way of the HTTP headers, or I need to check what came in on the headers I received. And if it's there, then I'm, I'm OK. I don't need to give them a new number altogether. But the problem is that if you try to do something like this, for instance, I go to the top of the file, and you know what? I'm making a web page, so I want to do this. And this is all very reasonable. But then I realize, oh, I should really use sessions. So I'm just going to put session start down here and so forth. The problem is that this one line of code is meant to induce the set, colon, uh, set hyphen colon uh, cookie header. But that's a problem because you kind of missed your chance to send any HTTP headers. Because the moment you call uh, spit out HTML or the head tag, that means that the delimiter between headers and content has already been sent. In other words, if we pull up any web page using our little plugin here and actually uh, visit, actually, let's do this. Let's go ahead and use Firebug, which we'll start using uh, more and more now. If I go ahead and, uh, is it enabled here? Let's go to cs75.net. Uh, network. Oh, let's just use the other plugin. It's locked. It's disabled for this particular site. So if I go ahead and pull up cs75.net, hit enter, and I get all of these HTTP headers, the moment the headers are done being sent, uh, what happens is the actual content of the page is sent. So the delimiter being implied is sort of represented graphically here with this, this horizontal line. But what's really happening on the server is that after you send these HTTP headers, the last one might be, uh, the last one in this case is not set cookie, but content type. So that's a popular one. It's one that you might even have to set yourself at some point. The moment the server has sent this header here, this header here, and then maybe this other header here, content type. Uh, colon, say, text slash HTML. It then sends a delimiter of backslash n, and then it starts sending your actual web content. If it then realizes that you're trying to later in the story send set cookie, that's too late because, quote unquote, delimiter has already been sent. And that's simply because you spit out content too soon before calling session start. And annoyingly so, even this is bad. And this is one of those stupid sort of details that you probably, like PHP or any language like it, could probably avoid this particular gotcha. But what's problematic about this file? One white space means here comes some content, and then you're kind of changing your mind by waiting. So this is, again, just one of those beware simple issues like this. Um, it is uh, very easy to overlook something like that. Question in back. Uh, you had a line of code up here? So like, uh, I implemented like a whole object, like I don't code great, and then I code great, and then you know, I just like took it back and it out. But you must have had that code actually in between the PHP yeah. braces. Yeah. So that's OK. That's OK. You can, do, you can write code before session start, but you cannot send any literal raw output. So this is bad. This is even worse. Uh, similarly, would it be bad to even do something simple like print this, I mean, now you're just really messing with the web server. But that too, <laughs> right? So that too would be bad for precisely that reason. And there's another more subtle way of inducing this problem. If I do something like this for each, uh, let's say, XML, uh, let's say, uh, category as C, and then I just want to do some stuff. I want to say categories. Get C. So I just want to create an array of categories using some fairly basic syntax after iterating over some XML file that assume I accessed earlier with the typical constructor or simple XML open file. So this line of code, the for each, could actually send content to the browser. Can you come up with a situation in, in which why? So it crashes in a sense. If there is no XML object, which there is not in this case, I will be trying to dereference effectively a null pointer. So if I literally have not 
created the XML object at all. I haven't used the XML equals new simple XML element and so forth. In other words, I just kind of forgot to actually tell the library what XML file to open. Well, this dollar sign XML variable doesn't even exist. So certainly trying to access dollar sign XML arrow anything is going to create a problem. And unless you've disabled them entirely via php.ini or via some other configuration option, this is going to trigger one of those warnings. So it's not an error per se. It's not crashing per se. But it's going to literally spit out that string that says, warning, uh, XML is not an object at line 2. Something like that. Well, that's kind of a problem if that's now being sent to the browser, maybe unbeknownst to you, before you're ready for any such content to appear. So again, the sort of last takeaway for tonight with regard to sessions and with regard to headers is also beware of those kinds of errors. Because if you're generating an error accidentally and it's getting spit out to the browser, there could be unexpected behavior altogether with the whole process. Yeah? Uh, not really. If you want to call session start first, that is A OK. In fact, it's not a bad rule of thumb to adhere to. So, but I mean, you can always, it's still possible to make mistakes. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is another stupid thing. Um, let's see, call this include.php. So if you have a file that you're writing that includes another file, and that other file, in this case include.php, happens to do exactly that, spit out some text, spit out some white space, that too will induce this error. And it's also, again, very easy to do. What you were just describing uh, would be something like this. Include.php, I might do some stuff, and then uh, you know if I do this, but then get a little <laughs> carriage return happy. I mean, this, as stupid as this appears, will create exactly that same problem because this single white space will be sent, spit out before the session start. So there's one thing that some developers do, which I'm personally not a fan of because it feels kind of sloppy, but it does avoid this particular problem. You can get away with leaving off altogether the closing brace for a PHP tag to ward off exactly this problem. I tend not to do it, but you can do it. And some people do just to, again, avoid stupid headaches, especially when some text editors just like to insert a blank line at the end of the file just because it's one way of dealing with that. So FYI. Good, good subtlety. That would actually have been the other kicker that, of course, comes up on the bulletin board uh, immediately. Yeah? Oh, it's a good question. So stylistically, how much white space should you surround these tags with? I would say it depends. So if I have to write multiple lines of code, I will typically do something just like I've done here. If, however, I am, say, later in my file, just assume some stuff has gone on there, and say I'm at the point in the file where I have a paragraph tag here, and I just want to spit out a variable, I will very often say variable here and just do it in line. It really depends on how many lines of code I'm trying to spit out. So, and you'll see this by way of various lecture examples and in the section examples. It's really a matter of preference. Okay. And you'll find, too, that a, anytime I'm writing code that's for, say, other people to use, I will get into this relatively annoying, redundant habit of putting the PHP tag just because it's server specific. If their server doesn't support this, they're really going to be annoyed if they have to go through every damn PHP file I handed them and add this particular token. Um, when I'm writing my own code for my own server, I find it very, very annoying to have to type that every time. It just looks ugly to me. So another style thing that actually has some technical implications. OK, so let's now turn our attention to an actual functioning example that's not so uh, weak as to support only J Harvard and Crimson as a password. So among our examples tonight, we have these enhancements of our previous example. So let me go ahead and pull up home.php version 5, 
currently is going to trigger this warning. So this recall is a little plugin that we've added to our web server called xdebug. You can add it to your own XAMPP installation or your own web server. And you'll find that the stack traces that you see on our server anytime there's a problem tend to be a little more informative than the typical PHP error messages. And we do this not because users should see these kinds of messages. This is sort of an example on uh, poor error handling. But it's very useful, certainly, for development. So it creates this fairly ugly orange and yellow thing. But it does give us a little more information. It looks like access is denied for some user, uh, CS75 at localhost, using, well, maybe that's the problem, no password. And this relates to the MySQL connect function. So now that we're introducing a database, it's not quite as simple as just telling PHP what the name of your database is and expect it to go grab all the contents and return it in one big variable. You have to be a little more sophisticated than that. So now, rather than just open a file locally like we did with an XML file or a CSV file, now you have to connect to the database. And this not very complicated, but does require two steps. One, you connect to the database using a username and password. Um, and its host name or its IP address. And step two typically is to then say, OK, give me access to this specific database. So this is really semantics, but a database is generally a database server on which there live multiple databases. For instance, you are all going to be using the same database server, cs75.net, but each of you will have one or more databases of your own inside of there. And for each of those databases, you'll have a username and password. And inside each database, you'll be able to create any number of tables. So what one would typically do is, um, even if they're sharing a database server, they'll create their own database for a particular project or their own application, give it its own username and password and privileges. And then they put all of the tables related to that application within that database. But if they then go work on some other project, even if it's going to live on the same server, you typically don't want tables from different apps commingling. So you create a separate database for that other app, which is good not only to keep a nice separation, but it also makes it easier to change who can access what particular uh, tables and such. So there's kind of a problem here, but it's very easily explained by the fact that in login5.php, I didn't actually provide an IP address, username, or password. So how do we go about doing this? Well, you can certainly use the MySQL command line client, and you simply create a new username, new password, and such. But again, in the interests of automation and simplicity, you can also log into panel.cs75.net and project uh, Two will walk you through precisely this process. You'll see that I've kind of littered my own account with a few different example uh, databases over time. We'll go ahead and add just one more to the mix. I'm going to go ahead and click Create a Database. The database name will be Mailin Monday, since today is a Monday. Uh, the username doesn't matter what it is, but I'll just be simple and give it the same name as the database just to keep me sane. The password, I will for now just say uh, P-A-S-S-W-R-D because you're going to see it anyway. All right, This too is something I'll delete right after class. Create. And that's it. So now, P, uh, now the panel will inform me of these uh, fields. I'm going to go ahead and copy the database name and fill in the blanks here. So the first parameter you would see in the documentation for this function is the name of the server. If you're doing your work on cs75.net, you can simply say local host, which means this particular server. Uh, if you like IP addresses, you can also give the local host IP address. You could probably also say cs75.net. Um, if you're developing on your own machine for Project 2, which many of you tend to do, you won't be able to input cs75.net because for security reasons, we don't let outside computers connect to our database. So we don't allow incoming MySQL connections. So what you'll want to do is type in instead localhost or 127.0.0.1, but make sure you are running a MySQL database, which is very easy if you've used XAMPP or something similar. You'll get it for free out of the box. And just to be clear, what you'll be able to do for Project 2, now that you're using a database, you can create your database tables on your own computer. And then actually using PHP MyAdmin, you'll see there's a tab that says Export. You can literally export your whole database, which is not going to be very big for this project, just as one big text file that you can literally highlight, copy, and paste into the Import tab on cs75.net when it comes time to actually move your application over. It's very easy, and PHP MyAdmin in particular makes that quite easy. So for now, localhost will refer to the server that I'm on. Uh, this is the username that I provided. This is the password that I chose. And now down here, I need to call MySQL select database, which is again going to have this 
identical name. So it's going to, again, wrap a little uh, ugly here. Um, you have printouts of these code, uh, this, this code from last week. But notice that I'm doing a few things that you wouldn't do in production code, per se. But for examples, it's quite useful. So if this function, MySQL Connect, does not return some non-false value, um, go ahead and just die with this error message. So die is, again, one of these sort of heavy-handed approaches to error handling. It's going to spit out a message to the browser saying, could not connect to database. Not how you would handle problems for actual users. But for us, for debugging purposes, it's actually useful. You want to select the database here, which means out of all the databases on this server, which there's probably a couple hundred by now, I want to go ahead and select this particular one. And hopefully, I'm picking one that mailin underscore Monday user actually has access to. So you can offer different credentials there. What you'll see is that when uh, questions come up over email or the bulletin board over the next few weeks, we have given ourselves access to everyone's database. So I can, for instance, log in as just mailin and see any database, because again, you have different levels of access possible with an actual database server. So now you'll find, if you recall the code from a few weeks ago, the code is pretty similar. So if the user and the pass field in the post super global were set. That means conceptually that the user clicked that button and transmitted some values to us with some, uh, uh, with some username and password. But now there's the slight difference in code. So previously we just said if user equals equals the user constant and pass equals the pass constant, go ahead and let the user through. Now it's not quite as simple because we don't have that username and password locally. They're not just constants. They're not variables locally. They're in a database. So we effectively need to ask the database, go search through all of your rows looking for username foo and password bar. And if you find them both, please return a result to me so that I know you found them. Now, there are different ways we can do this. But the approach I took for this particular example was the following. Notice at top left there, um, you see the beginning of a SQL statement. And we promised these last week. The so very basic statement in SQL is the select statement, where you literally say select. You then specify a comma separated list of the fields you want to select. Or if you're lazy or want them all, you just say star. And you specify from what table you want to select those fields. And then you specify some number of conditions or where clauses. So by convention, I'll tend to write SQL uh, statements in all capital letters with table names and field names in all lowercase. Just kind of makes the visual parsing a little easier, but it's not a hard requirement. But notice what I'm doing here with this sprintf function. So this is actually just a useful trick, um, at least in PHP. Sprintf is just a function that returns to you, it, it generates a formatted string. And this is useful if I want to generate a string, but a string that's a little bit dynamic. Most of it's always the same, but there's a piece of it that's going to vary based on some user supplied variable. So notice my use of dollar sign, uh, rather percent %s in the single quotes. What sprintf in this case will let me do is tell PHP, here comes a generic string, but there's this placeholder, percent %s go ahead and plug the following value into that string. And the point at which I tell it that is with the second arguments here. So notice it's a little complicated to see, but there's this comma here, which means sprintf typically takes two or more arguments. The first is that general structure for the string. And then the second and the third and the fourth is a comma separated list of the variables you want to plug in from left to right into any placeholders in that string. So the reason I use sprintf here is partly for just sort of stylistic reasons. It is good practice to escape any input that the user will provide to your application, lest they try to hit you with what's called a SQL injection attack. We'll talk about those when we get to security. But what I want to do is select from my user's table all of the rows whose user value is quote unquote whatever the user typed in. But if they typed in something malicious, maybe a whole lot of characters, maybe some backslashes, some single quotes just hoping to screw up my code, I want to make sure that any such dangerous characters are escaped. So I instead call the ridiculously long name MySQL real escape string. You just got to type it. Um, and pass it the user supplied string. And what sprintf does is it just pastes that into the string. Now, to be clear that there's really no magic here, and even this approach is not at all necessary, I could have done something even simpler and perhaps more familiar like this. Just take this string here and then use my dot operator to concatenate it with 
the result of this function too. So that would be equally correct. It just tends to be a little nicer when you're plugging in lots of variables to incur the cost of the additional function call, but just kind of structure everything nicely on new lines with commas and such. It's uh, discretionary. Yeah? Backslash percent. If you want a literal, per literal percent. Yep. Backslash percent. And if you want a backslash percent, it's backslash, backslash, backslash percent. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, there was some history that I think I read up on on Wikipedia once or in the PHP.net. I don't remember. There is an older version of this function that behaved differently. I don't remember what the distinction is. But what this function does hint at, which is a problem in PHP uh, 4 and 5 and maybe 6. I've not read up much on 6 just yet. But there's no notion of namespaces in PHP, at least in version 5 and before, which means that anytime you have a bunch of related functions, like MySQL connect or MySQL select database, MySQL real escape string, the convention is to name them with the library's name underscore such and such. So this is what many people have adopted as convention. Um, this will hopefully go away before long when there's actual namespaces or packages if you come from the Java world. Oh, did not take encoding like UTF-8 and this? OK. So there's a bug in the original version? OK, MySQL escape string, which was already pushing the limits of, I think, a long named function, but this one takes the cake. What's that? No. OK, other questions? OK, so let's see what this does then. So I've just prepared a, uh, a string here. And incidentally, pedagogically, this does tend to be useful to prepare your SQL string in a variable. Because frankly, then on the next line, I can just call print and then exit. If I want to just spit it out on the screen just for quick and dirty debugging purposes, frankly, it's very easy to create uh, incorrect SQL statements. For instance, had I omitted these single quotes, bad things happen. So if you're set, checking whether something equals a primitive, like an int, that's fine to omit the single quotes. But for strings, they're necessary. And um, unfortunately, um, it's very easy to make such mistakes. Yeah? One quick question. My SQL query is taking a reference to the connection. So is that select database storing something somewhere behind the scenes? Yes. So really good question. So notice that my next line of code here is MySQL query, which seems to just be assuming that you know what database it wants and what credentials it should use to connect to it. Yes, so there is some, um, there's probably a static variable that was inside of MySQL Connect, whereby this library, so to speak, is remembering what database you're connected to. If you look at the documentation, you can actually use MySQL Connect to connect to multiple databases simultaneously, but then you have to care about the return value, because the return value gives you a pointer to the open database um, or a handle to the open database. But for now, we can assume there's just one default. So what's happening here is I'm querying the database with this particular string. And again, conceptually, I am selecting star. So select all of the fields from a table called users, where user equals quote unquote whatever the user typed in. Now, in principle, how many rows should be returned for my database? If you're just assuming you know, a very simple tabular database for this. So ideally, 0 or 1, right? 0 if the user just doesn't exist or the user made a typo when providing their username, or just 1. If there's 2, I didn't really design my database very well because now there's some ambiguity as to who is who. So if this was, in fact, the case, what should I get back? Well, you don't get back the data. You don't get back a variable containing the row, per se. You get back a variable that re references what's called a result set. You can think of this as some kind of container inside of which are zero or more rows. But you have to ask for those rows one at a time. How do you do so? Well, first, I can just check if um, the number of rows in this result set equals equals 1. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? OK, so that's a good thing. It's a half good thing, because I at least know this user exists. Now I need to go and check if the password is correct. So let's see what happens next. So after I check if I did, in fact, find a row, now I have to go get that row. So there's a few different ways you can get rows. So one is to fetch it as an associative array, which frankly I think tends to be the most convenient, certainly for applications where you prefer uh, convenient coding over pure performance. Um, this will return an associative array whereby the field name, the column header, is your key, 
and the value is whatever was in the actual cell. So I can say dollar sign row quote unquote uh, user or quote unquote pass and get that particular value from that particular field. There's also MySQL fetch uh, array which could just return to you a zero indexed array, but you have to know then what were each of the columns in your array, sort of in the spirit of a CSV file, which tends to be more efficient because you put more of the burden on yourself than on the storage of these additional keys. But for now, I would just promote using this one. MySQL fetch associ. This puts in this variable an associative array containing all of the fields from that particular row. And now it gets very simple. If the password in that row equals equals whatever the user typed in, dot, 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 proceed to log the user in. And the dot, dot, dot here is identical to what we've done in the past. I just store the equivalent of a Boolean variable in the session super global, and then I do some fancy redirection to get the user back to home.php. But what we haven't done is exercised much discretion at all over what the username and password look like and what the alternatives are to this particular coding. So we'll do that after a five minute break. All right, we are back. So unfortunately, this example still does not work. If I try to log in with J Harvard and say Crimson, I get to this point still. So could not query database. Now, the big orange ugly message did go away. Why is that? So it's not dying. Well, it's. Um, it is dying with a different error message, but there's no warning being triggered by the MySQL connect function because recall the problem initially was just that I hadn't even provided any arguments. No IP address, no username, no password, no database name. I did fill in those blanks, but we just created that database, mailin underscore Monday, like 10 minutes ago. There's obviously nothing in it. There's certainly no usernames or passwords. There's not even a table with a field called user or password. So we now kind of have the luxury of being able to reverse engineer how this table should look. But let's go ahead and fill in the blanks. And just to ward off a question that came up twice in break, um, Striking similarity between this example and what's expected by project two, which is a login mechanism. So yes, certainly can you adapt, adopt, um, extract code from these examples and integrate them into your own project two. It, in fact, it's meant to bootstrap the process that you can sort of feel really content checking off that first box without having done much at all. Um, the stuff to follow will be will be more of a challenge. So what I'm going to go to is, uh, not the panel rather, but cs75.net slash phpMyAdmin. So again, per last week, this is just a freely available tool. It's on this course's server. It comes with XAMPP. It happens to be written in PHP. It's really just a coincidence. But I can now log into this thing with mailin underscore Monday and my temporary password. And what I get, again, is this sort of GUI interface to my MySQL database. So at uh, top left, you'll see my actual database name. And this will be important because if you end up reusing the username for project three as well, for the final project as well, you might have to specify what database you want to tinker with. In this case, I just have one. If I click on here, now you'll see that no tables found in database. That, again, makes sense. We just made this thing. So we need at least one table. And again, in the interest of making the application that's already been written work, what does the table need to be called that I'll create? Yeah, so users. And we know this, recall, by the simple fact that when I selected data from this code, I selected it from users. So that's apparently going to be the name for this database. Somewhat arbitrary, but certainly useful. How many fields am I going to need? Oh, so I called it users, so from users. I tend to name my tables plural because I'm going to have multiple rows in this table, each of which represents a user. Uh, so this middle line, select star from users, that's implying the table name right there. Oh, okay. So some folks, incidentally, as a matter of style, will be more explicit for themselves and will say something, we'll do a convention like this. So select uh, star from not just users, which tends to be my approach, but tbl underscore users, just to make it even more clear what's a key or whatnot. But again, you'll see things like this as you look at other people's code. Um, not for this particular project. So let's go ahead and create this. How many fields do I need? At least two. So at least two. Maybe I want some superfluous stuff like users, phone numbers, email addresses. Let's keep it simple. Let's just go with two for now. So two fields, click go. Here's that screen where I need to choose my fields. I know already that the two fields need to be called, unless I want to go change my code, user and pass. I have a little discretion now over the field types. Uh, any suggestions or requests? 
So char we could go with, right? If we're implementing sort of a Unixy system, we could say char 8 and limit it to 8 characters. Uh, password, sure, we can do that as well. Um, var char might be a little more compelling, doing var char of 100, var char of 20, var char of 255. I mean, anything that you know is sufficient for the size usernames you want to actually support. Um, what about a text field or a, a big text or medium text, which you might have glimpsed on the slide of data types before? This will probably overkill. When you're talking about text, that's when you're storing paragraphs and pages of text, a whole lot of data. And it tends not to be as efficiently stored because it's stored separate from the table itself. That's good when it's large, kind of silly when you're just storing something simple like eight characters or just a few. So collation, again, you can typically leave blank. Don't freak out if you see something mentioning Swedish by default. Attributes are irrelevant for character data types here, but you can see in the drop down that they're apparently related to timestamps and or integers. Um, not null. So this field here by default cannot be null, nor can the password. Does that make sense? Feels pretty reasonable, right? You don't really want one or the other, so you can make them not null. And again, per last week, these are ways of enforcing database level constraints on your data. You can certainly imagine in your PHP code, just don't insert the row if the username or password's null. But again, especially when you have uh, yourself doing the development and someone else being the DBA, the database administrator, or you just sort of don't trust yourself, it's certainly good practice to impose additional database level constraints just so your data doesn't become corrupted in some sense. Uh, scrolling over, we don't want a default value probably, even for the password. Better that that comes from the user. But now we have some interesting uh, options for indexing or constraints. So the first of these icons, which is just sort of a GUI friendly depiction of the idea, is the notion of a primary key, a unique key, an index, uh, uh, rather just a general index, and a full text index. So what does this mean? Well, if you're not yet familiar with actual database engines, a primary key in, uh, specifically is just meant to be a field that uniquely identifies a row in the table. In other words, if you have a whole bunch of data in your table and you want to make sure that there's some piece of information, some number, some string that uniquely identifies every row just because it's convenient, just because it's more efficient, that would be known as the primary key. It's not prerequisite for a database table, but it tends to be very useful. And in the interest of performance, it tends to be quite valuable. So in this case, username and password, should we make either of those a primary key? So it could be the username, right? Password, that's probably bad because people might, can have the same password, especially if they don't know each other. But we probably want the username to be a key whereby it is unique. Now here's when you might sort of roll back your thought process and realize, well, hmm, this, the implication of this, if username is the unique key identifying each row, that kind of means that the way to find people in this database is only by way of their usernames. But how long might a username be? So in this case, up to so eight characters. So if you think back to sort of old school programming where you really counted your bytes and operations, that means to find a user in this database, I need to compare up to eight characters for every user because I need to do pattern matching, string matching, literal string matching. Now that might, that's not the most efficient approach, right? Like what would be a faster way of finding a unique value in a really long list of values? So maybe some kind of hash map, or even more simply, just maybe a single character. That would probably limit me, though, to like 26 people or 256 people. Uh, sorry? An ID. Like a, an ID. So you know, unique ID, like an integer. Yeah. right? So it's, it's, twi it's half as bad. right? It's four bytes, typically, for a 32-bit int. But you'll see as your tables get more complicated, especially for project two, if you're trying to correlate a user's information from one table with that same user's information from another. For instance, for a user in the context of project two, you're going to have a user's table, like username, password, uh, maybe how much cash they have on hand for their portfolio. But then you're going to need to keep track of their stocks and what they've bought and what they've sold. And we'll, we'll walk through this in just a little bit. Probably doesn't make sense to put that just in the user's table, because then you kind of have to know in advance how many stocks someone's allowed to own. And it, it gets it's very messy very quickly if you try to cram everything into one table. So you'll find tonight and moving forward that you'll very often want to separate different types of data, but somehow keep track of who owns what data. And if you're doing this by way of strings, like usernames, you're going to start storing a lot of information redundantly. And so the typical convention is to use things like numeric IDs, integers, 
as primary keys, largely for performance reasons, um, both in terms of time lookups and for the space it involves. But we're keeping this simple. So FYI for now, but it will be very quickly become important. For now, let's keep it simple and just say, you know what, I am content with my very low traffic website using usernames as the primary key. Keeps it nice and simple, so I'll make it the primary key. Alternatively, I could make it a unique index, but the principle here is that you use primary keys to uh, represent the piece of data that uniquely identifies every row. Because as we'll eventually see, there's the notion of a foreign key, which is a primary key that happens to live in another table. So you can find it elsewhere. And you can impose constraints like that within your database. OK, so what else? Uh, that's enough. You do have discretion over engine, which we'll talk briefly about tonight. For now, it really doesn't matter for the application I am uh, implementing. So I'll leave it as the default. So that's going to be in version 6 or 7 in just a moment. So this is version 5. We're going to keep it simple. Just clear text. Yes? Can you have different storage engines for each table? Yes, you can have different storage engines for different tables, which is useful if you need what are called transactions on some pieces of data, but not on all. Can you join across? Yes, you can join across. Yep. OK, so let's go ahead and click uh, Save. Everything went well. And again, for sort of learning purposes and for posterity, so you know how to actually create these tables in other database engines or dynamically in code. That was literally the code that PHP MyAdmin generated and then executed. So I could highlight and copy and paste that into the SQL tab to execute it again. If I did, though, I would get an error because obviously the table now exists. And remember the distinction backticks is MySQL's sort of special character for avoiding conflating keywords with field names and such. OK, so now I have this table. Now, is this code going to work? Let me go back to my demo uh, code, which I seem to have closed altogether. So cs75.net, lectures, login 5. All right, let's try logging in with J. Harvard Crimson. Ooh, it did not die this time. There is no bad error message being spit out to the screen. So why is that? Why did that die message that said, could not query database go away? Right, so now there is a database, there, and specifically there is a table that can be queried called users. It's even got a user in a pass field. There's just nothing in it. So again, we sort of have the chicken and the egg problem here that's very easily fixed by just manually inserting data. I could go ahead and do this manually by using the Insert tab here. Let's go ahead and create uh, J Harvard Crimson uh, function. I don't need to apply anything special to it, so I'm just going to fill in the values and click Go. And now notice, again, for learning purposes, this was the query that was generated and then executed. But insert queries, we'll soon see, are not things that you're going to always be wanting to write, uh, execute via PHP MyAdmin. You're going to want to do it dynamically. Every time a user buys a stock, you're not going to log into PHP MyAdmin and execute the transaction, right? Your code needs to generate a string that looks like this and pass that string to that MySQL query function. So if I want to demonstrate this now, if I go to the SQL tab, and here's just a blank palette where I can run some queries. I'm going to go ahead and manually say insert into users. Uh, what are the two fields? User and pass. And then I want to insert the values. Let's say Malin and let's say Foo. Close parenthesis. So just to be clear, this is what I just typed out manually. That's sort of the typical structure for an insert statement, though there are slight variants possible as well. Click Go. Inserted rows happened very quickly. One went in. And so the same query uh, was pretty much generated. So now I can change back to my application. Let's try this one last time. J Harvard Crimson, login, and voila. So now I actually have a true database engine running my login mechanism. And so if there's any code you're going to start adopting, it's probably going to be version 5 onwards. Since otherwise your uh, CS75 finance will only work for J Harvard and Crimson. So now let's take a look at some variants here. So let me go ahead and let me roll this back to what it was. Load uh, login6.php. And incidentally, before you use this code out of the box, you're obviously going to need to create your own database, username, password, and plug in those values. OK, so now what can I do a little bit differently? So I took just a different approach, right? In many ways, uh, as is often the case with coding, you can implement the same thing in many number of ways. So here's another. 
So here I'm generating a slightly different SQL query. I decided to do the following. And this is just kind of a trick because technically I could let my database engine do these comparisons for me. I'm already asking the database to go find a row with this username. Why don't I also hand the database the password and let him do all of the work? He already found the data. Why does he have to return the data to me and then make me do the string comparisons? Well, one way to do this would be the following select one. Well, really, this is just kind of a marginal performance enhancement. I, I don't really need any values from the database. I just need a yes, no answer. Is there a username and password of these values or isn't there? So give me a one if there is. Don't give me anything if there's not. So this is kind of a nice trick when you just want to query your table for uh, truth. So here we have the following query. Select one from users where user equals a given string and pass equals a given string. I then pass in those two escaped arguments to ward off any malicious attacks by some user. And then I get back my SQL string. I execute that SQL string in the next line of code with SQL, my SQL query, dying as, as appropriate. And then I just check, well, if I got back one row, the implication is that I literally got back a row containing a column containing a value of one. So when I've been saying when you use select, you get back a row from a table, technically you're kind of getting back your own miniature table, a table comprising any of the fields that you specified with a comma separated list, or in the case of star, you get back all of the uh, available columns. So when I'm just saying select one, it's kind of like I'm fabricating a table on the fly that's one column, happens to just be one row, in this case, that just contains the number one. But conceptually, it's the same thing. I'm getting back some number of rows that just happen to contain a single number because I don't need any more data than that. So think of this sort of as a, a marginal enhancement of that last approach. Yeah? So that's a really good question. Uh, so what happens if I have two users that have the same username and password? So we kind of have to take a step back. Is that possible? given my schema. So anytime we talk about the structure of a database table, you call it a schema. Is that possible with the schema? So no, because of that primary key constraint. In fact, we can demonstrate this if I try very simply to input jharvard again with some random password. So it's a different password even. And I click go, well, there is a problem. So notice this, this will be a very annoying error message as you start to see it more often. Duplicate entry J Harvard for key one. It's a little cryptic, but the takeaway is that you're violating that primary key constraint. So this is very obvious in the context of PHP my admin. Had I tried to, had I actually implemented a user creation module, say a registration module, a la project two, I would get an error like that, not graphically, but the MySQL query function would return false. And that would help my code know, wait a minute, that insert did not succeed. Uh, yeah? When you get that error, So it's a good question. So uh, MySQL, by way of a few error-related functions, like MySQL error and MySQL error number, will can report back to you exactly what the error was um, or what explains it. So if MySQL query returns false, I decide to take the very heavy-handed approach of just dying. I don't care what the, error message, uh, what the actual error was, just say could not query database. But I could actually respond with the actual error message. So you'll see in php.net there's MySQL underscore error and MySQL underscore error no for error number. And you can use those to distinguish the case. You can also, frankly, sort of um, take that maybe bad leap of faith that if there's ever an error when I'm trying to insert a row, most, most likely it's because of some violation of a constraint like that, and then just assume what the error was. So you can go both routes. Other questions? In this case, we won't see any such error like that because, again, we're just selecting. We're not actually inserting. OK, so that was version 6. Let's take a look at 7 and see what else we can do. And here is, in answer to the concern earlier, a little bit of encryption. right? So this is not such the best setup because if I go now to my database, and I click uh, my database table called users, and I click browse. Little problematic if someone's looking over my shoulder while I'm debugging some problem here and poking around. More problematic if someone steals my username and password, gets into my database. More problematic if they hack into my server, download my database, and send it elsewhere, because now they have a nicely formatted list of valid usernames, valid passwords that are not at all 
encrypted. So this is generally bad practice. But this has certainly happened if people have uh, hacked into some server and they've maybe stolen some poorly designed users table that has unencrypted data, credit card information. I mean, this is what typically happens. It's not a username password. It's like a name, address, credit card information. And that's the table that gets stolen via some adversary who then starts using it. And in fact, I actually, a better opener to last week rather than the Domino's bug was the fact that for the very first time, my Amex was stolen in some form such that um, I am now a, an unhappy subscriber to a World of Warcraft subscription, two months worth. Uh, that appeared on my credit card. And I know what the game is. I have never once played it, um, but I no longer have that credit card. So Amex took care of it nicely. But that was probably an example of either some human jotting down my numbers and thinking it would never get traced back to their own account, um, or who knows what website it was whose database might have gotten abused in some way. So with that said, let's add some encryption so that even if someone compromises my server or looks over my shoulder, they're going to have to spend a good amount of time trying to crack my passwords to even get into my website. Well, fortunately, um, MySQL offers a password function. Unfortunately, it sucks. So <laughs> to use it, you can simply say password, in all caps is the convention for MySQL functions, pass it an argument. And what that function will do is, in this case, encrypt the password. So what the implication here is as follows, and this is very typical for um, systems with passwords, including Unix systems. So if you've ever sort of gotten annoyed at some customer service person because you call, you tell them who you are, they can't tell you your password even if you forgot it. That's because they can't technically because it's stored in encrypted form in the database. And it's not just encrypted. It was encrypted with a one-way encryption, which means it can't be decrypted, at least with very, very, very uh, low probability. So what you can do when you need to store passwords in encrypted form, but still uh, use them to authenticate users, you can just ask the user, you know what, you probably know what your password is, even though I don't, because I'm just looking at some random ciphertext, some encrypted data here on my database. You know what your password is or was. Why don't you type it again? I will then re-encrypt it and then take that version and compare it against the one that I actually kept around. And if they match with high probability, the user typed in the same password and I will let them through. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm now selecting one from the users table where users equals whatever the user typed in and pass equals the result of calling this built-in pass function on whatever the user typed in for their password. Now this is going to work in exactly the same way but does require that I store passwords in this encrypted form. So if I now use uh, login, uh, this is 7, Dot .php and I filled in the credentials, the name of the database and so forth. The problem is that this table now is not going to work. Why? Right, so it's not it's not encrypted these passwords. So now I'm going to be comparing s encrypted passwords in my code against unencrypted passwords. Now I could sort of read the documentation and actually figure out what the uh, how the password function works. And then I could have just inserted this field manually by typing it out. Uh, if I'm lucky, I can use the built-in password function. And you know what? I'm going to change jharvard's password to crimson. But this time I want it to get encrypted. So let me click go see what happens. And notice there's a slight problem here. When you start dealing in encrypted passwords, you can't just assume that eight characters is going to be enough, because the password function might actually need to generate more characters than eight. So that's what it's warning me about. So odds are this is still broken in this case. Um, but notice that no longer is the password stored in the clear. But according to this error message up top, something got uh, truncated, which means my field of eight characters was not long enough. And this is one of those situations where you check the manual to figure out how long your fields have to be for passwords and such. They typically are supposed to be uh, of type blob, binary large object, or something binary oriented, not necessarily uh, character or var char. So this still won't work, but it's very easy now to fix if I just change the size of that field or the type of that field. And again, by way of PHP my admin, I can do this by checking not the browse tab, but the structure tab. If I click the pencil next to the pass field, notice that it will let me change the type. And I could go in and I think, don't quote me on this, but I think for the password field, the blob is OK. Click Save. And now notice the SQL query executed. Alter table is the syntax you would use to change the structure of a table um, by actually executing commands as opposed to using this nice little GUI editor. So this is not so good only because the password function cryptographically is not very strong. 
strong. In other words, someone with enough free time and enough spare CPU cycles could, frankly, just try all possible words in the English dictionary, figure out what your password is, or just generally write a password cracking program and find it within our lifetimes, unlike certain ciphers. So, a slightly、um, more sophisticated approach would be this one. So, we won't spend too much time talking about sort of the cryptographic implications of this, but a stronger function than the password function is the AES encrypt function. So, AES is sort of、uh, one of the de facto standards these days in industry for encrypting、uh, any types of information. In this case, this,、uh, this function, AES encrypt, which is unfortunately wrapping onto two lines, takes two arguments the string you want to encrypt and an actual key. So, what I am simply doing now is I'm going to check. Does my database have this username and the following ciphertext, that is, encrypted password? What I'm doing, though, apparently, is encrypting every password with a particular secret, quote unquote, secret. Is my secret key? Again, if you don't have much familiarity or background in cryptography, honestly, just read a Wikipedia article on AES or on、um, two way、uh, reversible encryption, which this really is. But there's an obvious problem here, whereby I've not really moved away from the previous problem. What's worrisome about this sort of naive approach to crypto? AES function is better. It means it's a lot harder for someone via brute force to figure out what my key is, but what can they just steal instead? They can just steal this PHP file, right? Which is arguably easier than getting access to certain database files, especially if yours is a sh shared account. So, an alternative still, one that's sort of a nice heuristic to use. Is that you could, if the goal here is to create a situation where you're storing ciphertext, that is encrypted passwords, and you don't necessarily care about recovering them, right? Because you can just override the password and let the user change it via some other、uh, out of band channel, like a reset password link or something like that. What you can do is this heuristic, if you're following along. So call AES encrypt, which is just hard to brute force crack. Pass it the string you want to encrypt, which is the user's actual password, and then pass in as the key to use during the encryption their actual password. So you don't know their password, they only know their password. So effectively, what you're doing is encrypt their password with their password. It's going to generate a weird looking string that you can then store in your database. If your database then gets stolen, Doesn't matter because now people to crack those pass the encrypted passwords need to know the passwords, which means that's sort of like one of those catch 22s.、Um, the, the caveat here is if that you're sort of a, a cryptographer, if you're a mathematician, you can't necessarily take mathematical comfort in encrypting a password with itself. It's hard to make mathematical arguments as to what the implications are for security. So, what you could also do, for instance, is encrypt a user's password with the concatenation. Of their password with some other piece of data that's deterministic, like their username. But in short, you want to create a situation in which you're not hard coding into your source code or to your database anything in plain text, but the process obviously has to be reproducible. right? You can't encrypt the user's password with the current time because the next time they try to log in, obviously the whole thing won't work. So that's sort of a heuristic that's popular. Um, but just realize that you can't make strong arguments then that you know, my system is as uncrackable as the RSA algorithm, for instance, because here's my mathematical argument. It gets a little sketchy if you start doing weird but useful heuristics like this. So, better than using the password function, but not entirely、uh, elegant, I would say. Yeah? Not,、uh, yes, so banks and such typically require weird characters and passwords to ward off brute force attacks. If you let users use just alphabetical characters, that means there's only 26, maybe 52 possible characters, uppercase and lowercase. It takes much less time to guess a password that's only alphabetical than it does if it uses any possible ASCII character which they, or a keyboard character, which banks try to use. It just takes longer to crack the password. Uh, they, oh,、uh, yes, probably in a scripting language because it would be most database. I'm not familiar with any database functions that could sort of analyze the quality of a password. It's possible someone sort of threw it in as a nice feature these days, but odds are they're doing it in PHP or Java or whatever type of code. Yeah. 
And just to be clear, it's worth noting now that in addition to being able to store data, password, uh, databases like MySQL do clearly come with some built-in functions, which can be helpful. Now we'll eventually see more useful, uh, sort of more basic functions like the sum function. There's a function like average, so that you can actually do mathematical computations that might be useful across a table. If, for instance, you want to figure out how much how much money a user has. Uh, won or lost over time in some gambling application or some stock market application. To be sure, you could just figure out the mathematics and code, select all the data, and then add it all up using variables. But databases do offer this functionality as well. Other useful functions, though, are things like date format. You can store dates in a MySQL table in a very standard format, which is uh, year, month, date, typically this format. Now, that's all fine and good, but most humans don't like to look at dates like that, unless you're sort of a person taking a course like this, in which this sort of sorts nicely and feels nice and clean. People like commas and other such things. But the date format function, much like PHP's date function, can do the string manipulation for you and generate a, something that's a little more user friendly. Time format does the same kind of thing as well. So let's take a look. I think that was login 8. I think that was the last of our, yep, login examples. So for project two, incidentally, uh, you are welcome. You are welcome, encouraged to do the sort of the stronger version of the encryption. Um, certainly for debugging purposes, though, you might want to start with something more akin to login five, uh, which doesn't encrypt passwords. Because if you sort of have a bug in your password encryption, and you're trying to figure it out. Mildly annoying, at least initially. So perhaps roll out those features incrementally. All right. So what then? Uh, what then comes next when we want to be a little more sophisticated? So think here we have an example involving employees and orders, but let's try to make it more real. You already know that project two is going to be about implementing a um, stock portfolio management tool. And just to summarize what that's going to mean, you're going to have to implement a login module, the ability to log in and out, a registration module so that you can create users and passwords on the fly without having to call you and you, you use PHP MyAdmin like I've been tonight. Get quotes, you'll see, will interface with Yahoo Finance, which is actually a really neat near real-time feature that they offer, selling stocks, buying stocks, and history. So what are the implications now for database design? Well, let me just for uh, sort of discussion's sake, pull up Microsoft Excel, just so we have something a little uh, simpler to work with than uh, PHP MyAdmin. So I am implementing the database that's going to implement this idea of CS75 Finance. So I'm going to have a users table, and I'll probably have a username field and a password field. Um, what else am I going to probably need to have for a user in this kind of stock portfolio tool? Sorry? So yeah, so let's let's get into this good habit already. So let me go ahead and put in my ID field. All right, what else? So I'll skip ahead, just brainstorming. So they're cash, right? So there's some amount of cash that they have. I'm going to take the simple approach initially of just let me just put this all in the same place. Uh, so I'm going to have a cash field, but. Obviously, the user is going to have to be able to buy and sell stocks. Now, any number of stocks. So, hmm, let's see. I want. Let's. And this is sort of a very reasonable uh, thinking process. So certainly, if you've not had to design this before, here's a field for their first stock that they own, third stock, fourth. Right. I mean, this might be your inclination initially, and this is not an uncommon approach, right? especially in the context of web applications where there's like an address field. There's very often address 1, address 2, address 3, even though many, several of those are never even used. But it's just simpler to have multiple address fields so that if you need them, they're there. But this good idea, bad idea? This doesn't feel like it scales very well, right? Because you're going to piss off your clientele if they can only buy, hold four separate stocks at once, right? That's not really a value add of using your site. But if you say, all right, well, no one's going to have more than like 500 stocks, the, uh, the S&P 500. So maybe they, let's just bound it at that. But there's kind of more stocks than just those 500. So maybe there's some crazy day trader that likes to have even more than that. But even for the normal people, you don't need 500 empty columns or 499 empty columns because it's just a waste of space. Even if you're using var chars and whatnot, I mean, there's still some amount of space that's going to be eaten up by that. Plus, can you even imagine maintaining a database that's got hundreds of columns? Feels like there's some opportunities for better design. So instinctively, or soon to be instinctively, you want to factor stuff like that out. So whereas this might be my users table, 
So let me just make some room here to distinguish. This might be my users table. Feels like I want to have something like my portfolio table. And again, many different ways are possible here. But in my portfolio table, I want to keep track of maybe the stock symbol and maybe the quantity that the user owns. But what else? Yeah, their ID. So this is where we now have to somehow keep track of what row in the portfolio table is owned by what user. Now, we could just put the person's username, because that may, might very well uniquely identify them. But again, performance. Like, why do all this damn string comparison when you can really simplify and just compare integers much more efficiently? I mean, literally using individual registers in the machine. So let's use the ID. And to be clear, and again, we can can sort of decide for yourself your appropriate naming scheme. Let's be even more clear. User ID, ID is a little vague here. User ID, this is starting to feel a little better. So now if I'm a user, J Harvard, I'm going to have a row in the users table. Maybe my number is one, two, my ID is one, two, three. My username is J Harvard, my password's whatever. Um, and my cash is $10,000 by default, you'll see in the project spec. Every time I buy a stock, what table is going to get updated, though? So the portfolio. Every time I buy a stock, a new row is going to be added to the portfolio table again and again and again. Now, I'm going to have to do some, some footwork in order to figure out what stocks are owned by what user, because I kind of have to take the user's table and sort of conceptually join it with the portfolio table so that I know what it means if GOOG or MSFT, Google and Microsoft stock stickers, are owned by user 123. Right, that's not terribly useful. I need to somehow be able to map the user ID back to the person's name and email address and all that kind of stuff that you would see on E-Trade site or Ameritrade site and such. So we need to be able to join these tables back together. Well, how do we do that? Well, SQL itself offers the ability to join tables. So rather than sort of spoon feed a little too much specific there, imagine this example here, which is excerpted from one of the recommended readings in W3Schools, which has a really nice but short SQL tutorial. Here we have some table called employees. Apparently these employees have names, but they also have employee IDs. Particularly helpful when employees have IDs, because you could certainly have people with the same names. So you can't assume uniqueness for just persons, uh, people's names. And then there's this notion of order. So this is sort of a commission-based company. So we want to keep track of who sold what. But we probably don't want to get into what bad habits. Well, if the goal is to keep track of who sold what, we could do uh, a table like, uh, let's see, the name. And then what are we going to call these things? The product and the product ID. And then you know what? Just to be more uh, specific, so David sold a widget whose product ID is 987. Well, David also sold a, uh, what's, what's another? A gadget whose number is five, uh, 667. Already, where's the inefficiency here? Well, the name, again and again and again. And imagine it being a little worse than this. Suppose that employees don't just have names, but they also have email addresses. So you can imagine doing something like this, but this too gets even more redundant. So any time you start to see redundant data, so data that you already have elsewhere, that's an opportunity for um, redesign, or more uh, formally, normalization. So there's, if you take a proper databases course, there's these various notions of normalization and different levels of normalization. Frankly, I find the whole world much more simply understood intuitively, where if you're starting to feel like you're re duplicating information, there's an opportunity to factor something out into its own table. But the problem, of course, is as you start to factor things out, you eventually need to merge them back together if you're going to figure out who owns what and tell the users that in, say, the web page into which they log in. So here, again, is this example involving employees and orders. Suppose I want now to get a list of the employees, their names, followed by the items that they sold. I want to be able to iterate over all of the items that these people sold. I kind of want to join these two tables. I want to sort of overlay one on the other such that, oops, such that these IDs here line up with these ideas, uh, IDs here creating sort of a new table that's a merging of the two tables. And you do this by way of a SQL join. So this syntax here, it's a little scary at first, but it ultimately gets a very simple task done. I want to select the following. I want to select the name field from the employees table and the product field from the orders table. 
from what two tables? Well, to be clear, the employees, comma, orders table. So from both of those tables, where the employees table employee ID equals the I orders tables employee ID. So what that means conceptually is literally take one table on the employee ID field, take the other table on the employee ID field, and line them all up in such a way that you get back effectively a new table. A new table containing what two fields? Just name and product. And the reason that I'm now using this dot notation is to avoid any ambiguity. Because you could certainly imagine a, a person having a name, a product having a name. And so if you ever have ambiguity of key names, field names, you specify table dot field name. And so what is the table that I get back? Well, I get back this one here. And now notice Steven did come back twice because there are, even though there's one Steven in the employees table, he actually was responsible for selling two things. What did he sell? So he's employee 03. He sold both the table and the chair. So a join is sort of the programmatic opposite of what initially is just a conceptual design decision on your part to keep these various pieces of data separated. So this very simple query you'll find will probably be helpful when it comes time to display a user stock portfolio. You're going to need to generate a very simple HTML table that shows us the stock name and symbol and then how many the user owns and what its current value is. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Well, how are you going to get that information and associate it with an actual user? Probably you're going to need to join in some way, or at least figure out the user's ID and then do a separate select statement on the portfolio table to get back the information you want to show. Now, also in the interest of design, what's arguably a little inefficient about my decision to store stock symbols in my table? So multiple people could very well own the same stock, and therefore I'm storing a lot of strings, short strings, redundantly, right? G-O-O-G, M-S-F-T, right? That's uh, four bytes, four bytes. So in that case, you know, we could use an int, but that doesn't really gain as much. So just realize sometimes that don't necessarily feel that you need to slap a unique ID on everything. In fact, very often for low volume websites, even the course's own website, it's marginally annoying for us to assign every student in this course who already has a Harvard ID, who already has a unique email address, who already has a DCE ID, yet another computer science e uh, E75 ID. So we don't. We just use your email addresses or your Harvard IDs as your keys. So just realize that while there are some compelling conceptual motivations for factoring pieces of data out and introducing keys and such for the sake of normalization, it nece isn't necessarily um, the only metric you should use when making these calls. Sometimes, frankly, programmatic convenience is another one. Incidentally, uh, so that you've seen different syntax, this is an implicit join. Notice that the query we walk through makes no mention of the join keyword. You can be explicit and specifically say join employees with orders on these two fields. It's the same thing, slightly different syntax. So realize the distinction there. So problem, even with project two. A classic sort of illustration in this notion of race conditions is the following. So suppose you're back in college, and you have a roommate, and you've got one of those little dorm fridges, and you both really like milk or whatever beverage of your choice. Uh, you come home one day, your roommate's out, and you realize, damn, we are out of milk. I am going to go to the store and go get some more milk. So you leave your dorm room, you walk across the street, dot, 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 uh, scene shifts to your roommate, who's now coming home. Your roommate comes home, wants a glass of milk. He goes up to the fridge as well, opens it up, damn, no milk. He closes it, goes out to the store, different store, unfortunately. Half an hour later, both of you bump into each other in your room, and what do you have? Too much milk, right? You meant to plus plus the refrigerator, but now it's plus equals two instead, right? So there's sort of an analogy there with code. And this is problematic because the state of your variable changed while some other operation was in progress. The reason being that buying, checking the value of your refrigerator, whether there's milk, and refilling the refrigerator is not a quote unquote atomic operation. Stuff happens in between. For instance, roommate comes home and does some other things. So this is very problematic when it comes to databases, especially when you want to update multiple fields at once, multiple tables at once, or worse yet, when multiple people are trying to access your website 
at once, right? You really can't expect your users to wait until the next person is serviced. You have to enforce that programmatically, especially if hits are coming in every second or even several per second. So this is very representative of a very real problem, even in the context of Project 2. For instance, Suppose that a malicious user who wants to mess with your fake uh, financial system sits down at two different computers, maybe even two browsers, two laptops. They sign into their account and they see, aha, I have 10,000 fake dollars with which to play the stock market on both of these computers. So I pull up the, a quote for Google on this one. I pull up a quote for Google on this one. I see what their prices are. I then say, I want 10 shares over here, 10 shares over here, and I hit enter here. That request goes to the web server. The web server checks your user's table and says, oh, David's got $10,000. Yes, he may buy this stock. But then that thread in the server is suspended just because the operating system decides you've had enough milliseconds on the CPU. Now my other computer's request is serviced. The thread realizes, oh, you have $10,000 in your account. Sure, you can buy this stock. Now the operating system says, you've had enough CPU time. Let me go finish filling this guy's request. You now own. 10 shares of Google here, this transaction completes. This guy doesn't realize that that transaction just happened because he too is sort of getting you some milk. And so now you end up with 20 shares of Google and perhaps a negative balance, right? At least, you know, it depends on Google's share price for 10 shares. But yes, you might have gotten twice as many shares for the money because the state of your portfolio was checked. Then some stuff happened, including your purchase of this stock, but the state might have changed during that whole process because of these low-level machine details, various internet performance issues, simply because this operation of checking your stock portfolio's value, your cash balance, and then actually um, buying that stock are not, by default, Atomic. Same deal with an ATM machine, right? There's a problem with an ATM machine. If you have, like at South Station, there's two ATMs right next to one another, you could probably finagle two um, debit card, two uh, ATM cards somehow, log into both of them, unless they're actually checking for this kind of scenario. You check your account balance simultaneously on both ATMs. They say, yeah, you've got some money in there. You then do fast cash and try to get 20 bucks out of each of them by literally hitting the screen simultaneously. If Bank of America or the like are not making atomic transactions for checking balances and updating tables, you there too. Could you get $20 out of each machine but have it only minus equals 20? in total in their backend database. So many different cases in which this comes up, including something simple like project one or project two. And so you need to ward, uh, ward off this problem. Now there's a couple of different ways. In MySQL, there exists a very specific capability called the insert into on duplicate key update statement. So what this is, is sort of a special statement. It's not supported by all databases, but it's so nice that it is in MySQL that will do two things atomically, potentially. What this statement will do is it will try to insert, say, values A, B, and C into some table. But if, say, the A key is already there, suppose that A represents your primary key, suppose it's already there, then it won't let anyone else touch this row just yet. It's going to go ahead and update those values B and C, uh, or rather just C in this case. So it's a little cryptic looking right now, but all this is saying is that you're effectively doing, this is sort of like doing two statements at once. This statement saying insert into the table, but if you notice a collision, update it instead, is sort of conceptually similar to say select A, B, and C from the table. Let me check if they're there, and if they are, let me now execute an insert. But because this is, so to speak, a one-liner that's executed all at once, it is atomic. And if it's not obvious just yet why this is useful, you may see in project two why it might be useful to insert into a table, but update as needed. For instance, to make this more real, a user had better be able to buy some shares of Google, but then the next day buy some more shares of Google. So for efficiency, you probably don't want to have, you could have multiple rows, each of which represents a transaction. It's going to get a little annoying if to figure out how many shares of Google a user has, you have to sort of add up all these multiple rows. Kind of feels cleaner if you just update one row in the table for that user and that stock. Google, here's a prime candidate for either inserting a new purchase into the table, or if one's already there, just update the quantity of shares that the user has. Same for cells as well. Well, what else can you do more generally, especially if you need to try to do a whole bunch of things? And this will eventually become even, um, 
um, the case, certainly if you start coding stuff like this after the course. If you need to up, do multiple transactions on your database, do a select here and do an update here, maybe a delete here, because a one click of a submit button really induces a lot of changes in your database. If you want to do all of those things conceptually at once, i.e. make them atomic, you need to start a transaction. So one of the reasons to exercise some judgment when choosing a database engine is to choose one that supports a transaction. And by that I mean this. Literally, if you choose the InnoDB engine via PHP MyAdmin or via the command line for a table, you can execute four queries like this. So by this I mean take each of these strings, put it in quotes, and pass it to MySQL query in the context of PHP. Start transaction and forms the database. Here comes a bunch of statements only do them together or not at all. Here's the first statement. Here's the second statement, commit. Only once the database receives the commit instruction will it proceed to execute all the previous instructions, but all at once. No other user's commands or statements will get inserted into the middle of these, uh, these options. This is useful for the following reason. If you determine that for whatever reason one of these, uh, one of these statements failed, Maybe some value wasn't found, or maybe there is already a negative balance in an account, and you decide, whoa, I've already just made some, tr uh, some changes to my database, but I don't want them to be committed. I want to roll back everything I was in the middle of doing. Instead of executing commit, you can execute rollback, and this will undo any of the steps that you had previously executed, but not yet committed to the database. So this is a wonderful way of you in code being able to say, do all of the following, but you know what, I, even if I realize midway through this that there's a problem because something has been changed or uh, changed my mind for some reason, you can roll back all the changes, but only with InnoDB. Um, with, and to be clear, InnoDB gives you row level locking, which means other users, even if you decide to execute 10 annoyingly long queries, other users can touch the database table so long as they're only touching different rows than you are. With MyISAM, you don't have transactions, but you do have locks, which are the heavy handed approach to this idea. You can say, no one gets to touch this table for the next several milliseconds or seconds because I'm going to execute this and this, and then I will release my lock. So this is very similar to what we did last week with file locking for the XML file. This is not ideal because it means literally everyone else is stopped trying to touch this table. But if you really need, keeping your data uh, non-corrupted and accurate requires keeping other users out and getting at uh, atomicity. This is the way to do it without my ISAM. And we'll talk in the future about other trade-offs. In particular, my ISAM actually tends to be faster for a lot of applications. But if you need this feature, you kind of have to decide between the two. So what are you going to be doing for CS75 Finance? Well, in addition to these features, um, you're going to be integrating with Yahoo Finance. And as I mentioned, I think last week, you'll notice on Yahoo Finance a little old link like this, download data, which the problem set spec will walk you through actually clicking. And what you'll get is very simply a text file. Or if you have Microsoft Office installed, you'll see it sort of as an Excel file. And what's so nice about that is that, again, a la the kitchen sink, PHP has a f get uh, CSV function, which will take a CSV file. It will read a whole row of it into an array for you and do all that parsing of commas and quotes and just hand you the data you need, which in this case will be stock prices and stock symbols and more. So we will see you in two weeks. Good luck in the meantime.